this morning. Take your Bibles. I know you got your sword with you this morning. Why would you go to a battle and not be, and not be armed? Amen. Take your Bibles. Go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Amen. You know, I look around, I see the faces of the mothers in here. Right. I know many of you mothers pray. I've been blessed to hear your prayers and watch you bow your head and shed tears. And, and, and I praise God that, that y'all do that. Sometimes you, you pray out of necessity and Sometimes you pray because motherhood is not, it's not easy. Sometimes it's just extremely difficult. I, I know that I got my mother here today. She would tell you it was really difficult. Amen. There's a, someone wrote one time, Mother's Day is traditionally the day when children give something back to their mothers for all the spit they produce to wash their faces. All the old gum they held in their hands. All the the noses they wiped, and all the bloody knees they make well with their kisses. This is a day mothers are rewarded for washing sheets in the middle of the night, driving kids to school when they miss the bus, and enduring all those football and soccer games in the rain. I, I can remember many times my mom running up and down the sideline with me in the snow and the ride and the ice and everything else. That's back when they had ice here in Georgia. Amen. And I, I remember all those times that she loaded us up in the back of the truck. You know, you can't do that anymore. I remember all those times she loaded load a whole softball team of girls up, my sister. And we'd go to Cordell, Georgia, to play softball. And we'd go to North Georgia. We'd go to North Carolina. We'd drive to North Carolina and play softball. And then she traveled with me everywhere to play baseball. I just remember those days. And she always, I was always her number one player. It's a day of appreciation for making ch your children finish something that they didn't really want to. It's a, it's a time when you didn't believe when they said they hated you. And you were with them in their good times and their bad times. What are mothers? Well, <coughs> mothers are teachers. Mothers are disciplinarians. Mothers are cleaning ladies. Some mothers are gardeners and mowers of lawns. Mothers are nurses and doctors and psychologists and counselors and chauffeurs and coaches. Mothers are developers of personality. <laughs> when I tell you, when I first came here, I said, what you see is what you get. Well, take a look. Amen. Because if it hadn't been for her, I wouldn't be who I am today. <laughs> but they're developers of personalities. They're molders of vocabularies and and shapers of attitudes. Mothers are soft voices saying I love you. And mothers are a link to God, a child's first impression of God's love. Mothers are all these things and so much, much more. One of my favorite columns by Irma, Irma Bondback tells of God in the act of creating mothers. I, I've used this, this illustration one time before, but I, I think it just fits so well. She says that on the day God created mothers, He had already worked long overtime. And an angel said to him, Lord, you sure have spent a lot of time on this one. And the Lord turned and said, Have you read the specs on this mom? <laughs> She's supposed to be completely washable but not plastic. She used to have 180 moving parts and all of them replaceable. She used to have a kiss that will heal everything from a broken leg to a broken heart. She used to have a lap that will disappear whenever she stands up. She used to be able to function on black coffee and leftovers. And she's supposed to have six pairs of hands. Six pairs of hands, the angel says. It's impossible. Oh, it's not the six pairs of hands that bother me, said the Lord. It's the three pairs of eyes. <laughs> See, she's supposed to... Uh, Taylor laughed, but she knows this is true about mothers, <laughs> ain't it? She's supposed to have one pair that sees through closed doors so that whenever she says, what are you kids doing in there? 
She already knows what they're up to. Amen? Amen? She has another pair in the back of her head to see all the things that she's not supposed to see but must see. And then she has this one pair. This one pair right in front. This one pair that can look at a child that just goofed it and communicate love and understanding without saying a word. That's too much, said the angel. You can't put that much in one mind. We don't, why don't you just rest for a little while and, and resume your creation tomorrow? No, I can't, said the Lord. I'm close to creating someone very much like myself. I've already come up with a model who can heal herself when she is sick, who can feed a family of six with a pound of hamburger, and who can persuade a nine-year-old to take a shot. <laughs> the angel looked at the model of motherhood a little more closely and said, she's too soft. Oh, but she's tough, said the Lord. You'd be surprised at how much this mother can do. Can she think? Asked the angel. Not only can she think, said the Lord, but she can reason and compromise and persuade. Then the angel reached over and touched her cheek. This one has a leak, he said. I told, I, I told you that you couldn't put that much in one mile. That's not a leak, said the Lord. That's a tear. What's a tear for, asked the angel. See, angels have no emotion. What's a tear for, asked the angel? Well, it's for joy and for sadness and for sorrow, for disappointment and for pride. You're a genius, said the angel. And the Lord said, oh, you don't understand. I didn't put it there. I praise God for your mothers this morning. I thank you that you're here this morning to hear what God has for you. Maybe with all that this in mind, we can better understand Miss Zebedee. Amen? The mother of James and John, if you will, take a look at that. I'm going to ask Brother Calvin, would you stand and read verse, uh, verse 20 through 23 in chapter 20 of Matthew? 20 through 23? Yes, sir. It said, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him, with her sons, kneeling down, and asked something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but if it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. May God bless the reading of his holy word this morning. Now, Miss Ebony was aware of the teachings of Jesus about his kingdom. She was also very aware of the fact that her sons, James and John, were close to him. Think about it. They were two-thirds of the inner circle of Peter, James, and John. So they were very close to Jesus. So she was certain that when the Lord formed His kingdom that they would have positions of reasonably reasonable authority. Amen? Amen? But in the first part of this same chapter, Jesus tells a story that must have disturbed her a little bit. Now, now I want you to kind of listen to what i got to tell you. You know, mothers are very protective. I can honestly say that if I needed somebody to go to the, to the school and defend me, my mother was there. If I needed somebody to counsel me, my mother was there. Amen? If I needed somebody to discipline me, my mother was there way too much. <laughs> so, so, but the bottom line is, here we see Miss Eddie, she loves her sons and she, she cares so much for them and and she's, she's really concerned about what's going on because this, this story before was about a landowner who had went out to find laborers early in the morning. And they agreed on a fair wage for the day and they started working. And then he went out, you know, he saw things weren't going according to plan, so he went out in the afternoon and he hired some more people and they agreed on a, 
to go to work for him and, and it still wasn't come to pass what needed to happen. So he went out on the, on the, on the last hour and he hired some more people. And they finished the work and he paid them all the same wage. Now, that would get your attention in those days if you were a mother and you had two guys that were following around this man who was supposed to be the king of kings and lords of lords. It would concern you about where their position was at. And as a mother, she was concerned about what was going on with her children. It must have caused her to wonder, will my sons really have positions of authority in the Lord's new kingdom? So when the opportunity presented itself, she came to the Lord. And Matthew says that she bowed before Him and made this request. When you establish your kingdom, please let my son sit in places of authority and honor on your right and left hand. Now, we might very well criticize Miss Ebony for what her being presumptuous. But since today's Mother's Day, maybe we ought to think for a few minutes concerning some positive things about Miss Ebony. You see, we need to also recognize that when she came to Jesus, while Jesus did not grant her a request, neither did he deny it. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> he simply reminded her of the cost of being seated on the right or on the left and told her what it is that the Father who determines who will be seated there. So, so the first thing I want you to see <clears throat> is now what are some of the good things about Miss Ebony? First of all, she came to the Lord praying that her sons might be a part of, her king, of His kingdom. Now, I can think of no more important task of motherhood than that to seek a, a, to ensure that your children are a part of the kingdom of God. That is probably your number one priority as a mother in the world today. It's to, to check your child from the neck up and make sure that whenever you go to heaven, you'll see them in heaven too. <clears throat> I want to tell you today, I praise God for my family, that God has seen fit to, to touch them in one aspect or another, and that God has been dealing with my family in all areas. Amen? So I'm praying that one day what my wife preached to them will come out. You know, it said if you'll train them up in the, right? Train them up in their early years, they'll return in their later years. Amen? You, turn up, you train them up in the ways and the ambitions of the Lord and they will return in their later years. Amen? Amen. So what we're praying is that God will answer that and He'll be, a, 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 we'll be obedient. He'll be faithful. Amen? Which He's always faithful. I know that many mothers pray. I said that earlier. Sometimes they pray out, you know, we pray out of necessity. Sometimes they pray because motherhood is just difficult to deal with. Amen? But it's just what it is. James Dobson. Tells about a time he came home when his son Ryan was a small baby. It had been a, a terrible day for his wife, and Ryan had been sick and had cried all day. And once she was changing his diapers, and the phone rang, and <coughs> Miss Shirley reached over to answer the phone. She didn't fasten up the diaper, and just then Ryan had a, another attack of diarrhea. Now, they were on the couch. So she cleaned up the mess and, and put, him, put him in clean, uh, sweet-smelling clothes. Then she took him into the living room and fed him. And then as she was burping him, he threw up all over himself and all over her and all over the couch again. Amen. Well, Dobson comes walking in. He writes this. Yes. He said, when I came in the house, <coughs> I could smell the aroma of motherhood everywhere. <laughs> Shirley cried out to him, was all this in my contract? <laughs> you know, sometimes mothers pay just, uh, pray just out of the frustration of it all. And sometimes in the frustration of trying to teach our children, we realize the difficulties of communication. A friend of mine remembers very clearly the time he gave his two-year-old two -year son his very first responsibility. He told Steve to watch Susan his baby sister, while he was stepping out of the room, and he had only gone for a few moments when he heard a thump, and Susan started crying. <clears throat> he rushed back in to find that Susan had fallen from the couch and was stretched out on the floor. Meanwhile, Steve sat there and looked so innocent. Amen. 
My friend said, Steve, I told you to watch her. Steve answered, I did. <laughs> he watched her fall, and he watched her cry. He did exactly what he was told to do. Amen? Being a parent's not easy, is it? It's not an easy chore. Sometimes you're filled with joy, and sometimes with sadness. Sometimes your children make you so proud that your button's about to pop off. Amen? And sometimes you can't find enough handkerchiefs to dry your tears. That's right. I can understand the feelings of this mother with three children who was asked, if you had it all to do over again, if you had it all to do over again, would you have children? She replied, yes, but not the same ones. <laughs> <laughs> Being a parent's just not easy. It's difficult. <coughs> But Miss Ebony gives us a valuable example. For she prayed earnestly that her sons would be a part of this kingdom. We need the same concern for our children, y'all. What good is it if a child, if our children are successful in making money and, and driving fine automobiles and living in good neighborhoods, but they don't know God? What does it matter if they gain the world but lose their souls? I hope that in the heart of every mother and father here this morning, there's a burden to go to the throne of God and to pray for your children, to pray that they will be saved, saved from eternal damnation and saved for eternal life with Jesus our Lord. Amen. That is the first place we should be in the beginning. Second thing I want you to see this morning is that Ms. Zebedee, in her prayer, she prayed that her children would be a part of his kingdom, but she prayed that he would be active, that they would be actively involved in the work of his kingdom. Maybe it's not enough just to be saved, y'all. Huh? Something to think about, isn't it? Oh, I'm saved, I'm good. I'm good to go. I got the Lord in me. What comes out of you? It's my question. You know, here's the thing is, is we don't watch it if we're not careful in our lives. We become so complacent with church that we get to a place where we think, oh, somebody else can do that. Amen. Somebody else can handle that. I've been doing this for 45 years. And it's time for somebody else to do it. Not necessarily. Amen. <coughs> God may have a different plan than what your retirement plan is. Let me tell you something, though. He's got the ultimate best retirement plan you could ever ask Amen. for. Amen. All he asks is that you work till the time of his coming to get you. Amen. And, and, and that could be any time. Amen. But here we see that, that the church, <coughs> we've got to come to a place, come to a place that understand that churches are full of people content just to fill a pew on Sunday mornings. <laughs> or oh my. There are plenty of people willing to sit back and receive the blessings. We're getting like the fat calf, amen? But seldom do they get involved in doing any of the real work of the church. I, I can honestly say, we got a house full this morning. And I'm going to tell you, out of 100%, 10% do the work. Amen? But it's time for us to step up as a church and as a body of Christ, it's time to step up. It's time to step out. It's time to be the people that, that we've been called to be. Listen, mothers, I want to tell you there's nothing more important than to get your child involved in the in, ins and outs of church. Amen? The incomings and the outgoings of church. It's important that you start to disciple your own children. Amen? But, but listen to me this morning. There are plenty of people who want to sit back and get the blessings. But do they seldom get involved and do the real work in the church? But where does the spirit of service begin? It's my question. Well, it begins at home. It begins with mothers and fathers setting the example and praying that their sons and daughters might be involved in the work of the kingdom as teachers and leaders and discipling others. That they might be the ones who go out into the world and find the lost. To see the church continues on until Jesus comes again. He's coming, by the way. Amen. Amen. <coughs> I'm going to tell you, 
I'm going to tell you, I had a buddy of mine, I've, I've used this example before, but I had this buddy of mine, his mom was 93 years old when she went to be with Jesus. And I went over there, I was going to console him, John, I was going to say, brother, you know, I'm so sorry to hear about Miss Joyce, I'm so sorry, my, not your Joyce, Miss Joyce, I'm so sorry to hear about what happened, blah, 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 he's dead over here. My mother was 93 years old. She lived a full life up to the week before she died. And she lived a full life for Jesus even longer from the time she could remember who Jesus' name was. He said, I'm not worried about my mom. He said, what I'm praying is, is I got a bench out there. He said, I don't know why I put it out there because she ain't there. He said, but what I'm praying is, is as I sat in that graveyard one day, amen, he said, as I sat in that graveyard one day, what I'm praying is, is that that grave's will bust wide open. <laughs> And when they do, we're going to see these bodies go up in the air. He said, because you know what? Hallelujah. I'm going to be gathered up there with them one day. He said, I said, so the guy, guy was looking at him. Said, in church, the guy said, you don't worry. You're not scared of that. He said, why should I be scared? He said, God's already promised me a place. I'm going to be with my mom. I'm going to be with my family. I'm going to have to that grave bust open. It's not going to be zombies in there. Now, that would scare the fool out of somebody that didn't know Jesus. Amen? Amen. But I want to tell you, that's not a bad experience, I don't think. I think that's going to be a good experience. So Miss Anthony prayed that her children would be actively involved in the work of His kingdom, and we need to walk in her footsteps too, y'all. So here's the third thing. Miss Anthony had big expectations. When you're working in the kingdom... There are no higher position than those on the right and the left of the king himself. And that's what she wanted for her sons. She didn't just pray that her children would be doorkeepers. She wanted them to on the right and the left of God. <coughs> of Jesus. Now, we may consider Miss Zebedee brash and presumptuous, but, but I admire boldness. Amen? Too often people are settled for, and we do it every day, Mediocrity in the church. Mediocrity is the killer of the church. I'm going to tell you that. Did you hear me when I say that? For too long, some have been content with just barely making it through the door. Whoo! Made it. Let me get in my pew. Oh, somebody's in my pew! What the heck? Now I got to, now I got to sit somewhere else. This is going to be a bad Sunday. <laughs> I would bust Mama out, but I'm not. I'm going to leave her alone. You better. <laughs> Anytime you hang your, your blanket and it's got your initials on it, on a chair, that's your chair. Amen? <laughs> so, so we see that for a long time, for, for, for too long, some have been content with just barely making it through the door. For too long they've been content with sitting back and letting things happen. You know, it's time for some of us to take our positions on the right and on the left. To become leaders, molding and fashioning the outreach of the church, mobilizing to make sure the message of Christ goes out into all the world. One thing I can say about our church here lately, we realize that there's an outreach, that there's there's people that need to be to, need to be reached to, and we realize that we have to do something drastic to make it happen. So guess what we did? The novel idea. We're sponsoring a missionary. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah! It's about time. If every church sponsored one missionary somewhere, we'd be in a heck of a lot better shape. Amen. But we've decided to sponsor a missionary. This guy is so appreciative. He is so full of Jesus, it ain't even funny. Man, you guys stood up here. I didn't even think I could stand behind him when he got through up here the other Sunday. Amen? It was just so full of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I just praise God that we got a young man and a young woman fixing to get married. Their sole purpose is to go out and reach the lost and bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to a good report from this young man. Amen? And where he's going, he's going to need all the prayer he can possibly get. The Middle East is the worst place in the world for a Christian to go to. But that's where God's burdened them to go. Amen? But I want to tell you, it's time for us to mobilize. It's time for us to stand up. It's time for us to be heard. We've been sitting complacent too long. We've allowed, listen, we've allowed ourselves
ourselves to be pushed into a car and placed in a situation where we can't speak out like we should be able to speak out. It's time for us to wake up and come out of our sleep. Amen. I, I want to tell you this morning, it's time to strive for excellence, to reach for the very best there is. The Lord calls us to be His disciples and to be effective laborers of His kingdom. Do you remember? Irma Bombeck had God saying as He was creating a mother, I'm close to creating you. Something very much like myself. I suppose that's why today is special because we recognize that mothers, a mother's love is probably the closest example we can have to God's love. I can honestly say out of all the junk I put my mom through, my mom, poor mom, amen, y'all just don't know, y'all just don't know. She always loved me. Now, she might not have liked me, but she always loved me. Hey, Amen. you're supposed to agree with that. I like you. It's a love that goes through the valley of the shadow of death to bring life into being. It's a love that sacrifices itself over and over and over again. And would even dare to lay down his life for its own offspring. I've told this story before. I'll tell it again because I think it fits so well with the day. This is a story of the Holocaust in World War II. It took so many millions of people's lives. A guy named Solomon Rosenberg and his family were directly involved. In, it's a true story. Solomon Rosenberg and his wife and their two sons and his mother and father were arrested and placed in a Nazi concentration camp. It was a labor camp and the rules were simple. As long as you can do your work, you're permitted to live. When you become too weak to do your work, then you're exterminated. Rosenberg watched his mother and father marched off to their deaths. And he knew that the next would be his youngest son, David, because David had always been a frail child. Every evening, Rosenberg came back into the barracks after his hours of labor and searched for the faces of his family. When he found them, they would huddle together and embrace one another and thank God for another day of life. One day, Rosenberg came back and didn't see those familiar faces. He finally discovered his oldest son Joshua in a corner huddled, weeping and praying. He said, Josh, tell me it's not true. Joshua turned and said, it is true, Papa. Today David was not strong enough to do his work, so they came for him. But where's your mother? Oh, Papa, he said. When they came for David, he was afraid and cried. Mama said, there's nothing to be afraid of, David. And she took his hand and went with him. I'm going to ask Johnny and Miss Joyce if they'd come up. This is, that's motherhood, y'all. Mothers, this is your day. May God bless you in it. And I pray that if there is someone here who has never experienced the love of God that is so close to the love of a mother, this will be your time of decision. I pray this morning if you felt that you had to walk through the valley alone sometimes, so many times, that you'll recognize that there's a hand, a hand that's reaching out to you this morning. Saying to you, there's nothing to be afraid of. Amen. I'll go with you. And I pray that you'll recognize that there's one who has already gone through the valley of the shadow for you and made it possible for you to live forever. 
this morning, this morning, my Lord Jesus, He's extending His loving hand, His loving invitation, in much the same way the, the mother opens the doors of home and calls her children in. He's calling you this morning. My prayer is that you'll hear the call. Kind of unique the way my mother would call us in. See, I had an older sister, but she was kind of tomboyish. No, she would rip my backside, amen. She was a full girl. She could go. But she was a loving sister too. She loved me. She loved my little brother. But mom would go out and holler for us. And we'd be way off, you know, we'd be way off somewhere. And we couldn't hear and mom would say, Ann, go out here and get them boys, get them home. So Ann would go outside and she could do, she had this shrieking whistle. <laughs> now this thing would go, it would just, it would just reverberate. It would go all through the neighborhood. <laughs> And if we didn't hear it, well, the other kids would hear it. The kids, they would say, they would come to where we were at because they knew where we were at. They said, hey, your sister's whistling for you. But then a lot of times we'd hear that whistle. We'd hear that call. There was another call that I answered one day. It's a special call that only you can hear. Amen. Like the call of a mother who loves her child. Jesus makes a special call for you. Amen. He comes to you and He calls for you. Now I recognize the whistle. I recognize my mom's voice. And finally, I recognize the voice of Jesus. Amen. I'm asking you to stand this morning.